Welcome everybody to my channel. This is Angela, your own bookaholic Brownlim. Today we have a special guest in my channel here, and she is one of my favorite booktubers. Her name is Joanna, <laughs> and uh, she has her own booktube channel. So, Joanna, you want to quickly introduce yourself and your channel? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk about behave with you, and I have been loving your channel as well. Um, yeah, so I'm, on my channel, I mostly focus on fantasy. That's my favorite genre, but I do read outside of fantasy as well. And for whatever reason, this year, I've just been drawn to more nonfiction too. So mm -hmm. I've been reading about one nonfiction book a month, and that hasn't really been officially planned. It just has worked out that way. But I've heard so many fantastic things about the book Behave. And so when Angie said that she wanted to read it, I right away jumped on this idea of uh, reading it with her. So I'm so excited to discuss it with you today. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you for agreeing to this uh, <laughs> discussion and read along or buddy read, basically. So like Joanna said, today we are going to discuss this uh, book, Behave, by Robert Sapolsky. And uh, as uh, Joanna mentioned, this is such a fabulous book. Oh, a little bit different, right? Ours? Mine is red. <laughs> oh yeah yours is mine's mine's a a hardback too yeah oh ah, okay <laughs> so a little bit about our author robert sapolsky i'm reading directly from uh, the book here uh, so Robert M. Sapolsky holds degrees from Harvard and Rockefeller universities and is currently a professor of biology and neurology at Stanford University and the research associates with the Institute of Primate Re Research, National Museums of Kenya. He is the author of The Trouble with Testosterone, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, and a primate memoir. Sapolsky has contributed to natural history, discover, men's health, and scientific American, and is a recipient of MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. I have no idea what that grant is about, but I'm sure he deserves it because he is definitely a genius. <laughs> so um, that's a little bit about uh, Robert Sapolsky, the author. I'm sure he comes with a lot of um, you know, credentials. And I also re read from the book that he has spent around 15 years uh, studying uh, baboons in the wild. So yeah, he has uh, a lot of uh, merit when it comes to uh, op uh, science around primates, basically, and behavior of primates, for sure. Directly jumping into what the book is about, just a quick summary for our viewers. So basically, this in this book, uh, Robert, first of all, uh, or Sapolsky, <laughs> starts off with uh, saying that he has this childhood fantasy about killing Hitler. Right, confronting and killing Hitler, and uh, basically to punish him for the crimes against humanity, right? And while he is con contemplating that, and this is a repeated fantasy that he had throughout his childhood and sometimes as an adult, and then later on in his life, he realized that, but he doesn't believe in souls, he doesn't believe in punishment, he doesn't believe in evil. <laughs> so it's kind of a dichotomy. Uh, and also he points out many such dichotomies, like he loves to watch schlocky movies, but he is, you know, for gun control. And these things, and that uh, also boils down to how complex human behavior is as well, right? We live in dichotomy on a daily basis. And then he starts digging into human behavior. So the first part of the book is about um, finding out a behavior has occurred and what has caused it, right? That's the first part of the book, which is exploring the reasons behind why exactly a behavior has occurred. And the second part is much more relevant to the society uh, at large because he talks about how these behaviors impact the society, what is the effect that it has on society and how it influences society and how we can, uh, in fact, um, influence society in a better way. I think with many sobering points that we discovered through science, he somewhat concludes with a very cheerful note and, uh, you know, giving us hope uh, that, you know, uh, yeah, 
there is some positive things to look forward for humanity if you really try for it that's a small summary that i i i think uh, I, that i think is what this book is about what about you joanna yeah that's an interesting way to frame it i i honestly hadn't thought about the book in two parts like that before um i think the way that i was seeing it was that he was sort of offering the most holistic sort of picture of human behavior that he could possibly construct and making sure that it wasn't um divided up into so many categories that that that, that doesn't really paint an accurate picture in any possible way because all these different aspects they all relate they all converge mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. he's showing us human behavior processes that influence human behavior from neurological processes to mm-hmm. endocrinological processes to, yeah. um, to social behaviors, because you can't really, and environmental ones, genetic ones, and uh, sociological, historical. So he's kind of broadening mm-hmm. the view going mm-hmm. from the micro to the macro and sort of making a bigger statement about why we as humans behave the way that we do, why we act at our best and our worst and how we're not necessarily programmed to be a certain way that Mm -hmm. we're just basically evolving to respond, how we respond to a particular situation in particular circumstances, that that's an important point. And about this message, which I think is central to the book, which is about the ways in which we have these dichotomies. I like the way you put that and that how we can learn to, to work with that, how we can learn to have more compassion, how can mm-hmm. we, we can learn to have more altruism and sort of um, understanding that in actually a very nuanced way as well. So I feel mm-hmm. like that was sort of what I took from the book. And also, I think I mentioned this to you before, just how little control we really have over our behavior and our right. thoughts compared to what we think we do and Mm -hmm. how to, so it's a very humbling message. And at the same time, I do think he's, he still shows hope in it. He's not Mm -hmm. painting a nihilistic picture of human behavior. He's sort Mm -hmm. of showing us where we can move from here and how we can work through things. And not only showing the ugly and poor aspects Mm -hmm. of that, but also Mm -hmm. even some of the hopeful ones and, so that's what I took from it. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Because uh, I think my I have uh, actually taken a small screenshot from a talk that uh, Sapolsky had given. And uh, that kind of summarizes what you said. You know, you take a behavior and then what happens. And you cannot just say, okay, for example, a, a male, a human male is aggressive. And then you cannot just say that it is only testosterone which is causing it, you know, because it's a mix of all these factors that we'll be discussing uh, very soon. So yeah, that that's definitely it is. You, you just cannot say that it's this thing that caused somebody to act. It's quite easy. And that's where the implication to society comes in, because then the criminal justice system comes into play. Like, how do we judge a person, you know, whether did he really do it or was he built that way? You know, this is something that always bothers me a lot. Uh, but we will come to that. Yeah, very well put, uh, Johanna. The book is divided, at least the initial 10 chapters are divided into different stages of behavior. So what he um, says is that so there is a behavior that is occurred. So what has happened one second or seconds before that behavior occurred? And that is explained by neurobiology, right? That's chapter one, one, I think. And then the next chapter is about what happens from hours to, or minutes, seconds to minutes, basically the sensory input or cues that we take from the immediate environment. Um, and the second, and then he moves on to hours today, what happens? So, so many, uh, one day ago, what happened to your hormone levels? Right. So that could have an um, influence on your behavior today. And uh, then he moves on to uh, neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, even adult neurogenesis. And then he goes on to talk about uh, the effects of uh, adolescence, experience in adolescence and childhood on your behavior later on in life. And then prenatal environment. I'm sorry, my dogs are barking. Prenatal environment. And then 
epigenetics, which was also very interesting for me, uh, a new discovery, I think, because how environment affects the genetics. The genetics is not deterministic. Genes are not deterministic. That was also kind of new for me. I thought that genes define us, our behavior, but it's also the other way around. The environment also defines how genes oh, yeah, you know, yeah. act. That was kind of new for me. <laughs> and I love yeah. that chapter. And then the evolution of behavior as such. And then he, like uh, Joanna said earlier, also socio-cultural uh, influences uh, also shape our behavior to a very large extent. And then he ties it to our current society, like our justice system and free will and uh, concepts like um, war and peace, you know, war and peace and all that. Basically, human behavior uh, in uh, at the macro level. Chapter one, basically, it speaks about uh, all the different brain areas uh, is, uh, which are, have the most impact on our behaviors. So he starts off with amygdala, of course, the famous amygdala, and uh, how violence and aggression comes from. I'm sorry, she needs uh, <laughs> always somebody to pat her and touch her. <laughs> no problem. I love dogs, so it's a problem <laughs> And uh, violence and aggression in humans, how it is triggered by amygdala and it is instant before our thought kicks in, amygdala acts and asks us to act and it's all rooted in fear. And this is something very profound because we always say that, you know, xenophobia or homophobia and all this, right? And uh, people say it's basically hatred, it's not fear. But this hatred and aggression towards the others, uh, well, not like us, uh, comes from fear. So I think it's an accurate um, term given, even though people will argue that, you know, it's not a phobia, it's a hatred, but that hatred stems from fear. It was interesting. He does talk about that, like the difference between aggression and fear. And mm -hmm. you can be fearful, I guess, without being aggressive was the takeaway. Mm -hmm. He kind of hammers some point about that, which I'm failing to bring up, but I, I can look it up. Um, but he does talk a lot about the amygdala and mm -hmm. how the amygdala, it's interesting. He said that our natural default state as human beings is to mm -hmm. be trusting, which mm -hmm. I found really interesting. So we're naturally trusting creatures. And then he said, uh, but then he also says here, he says the default state is to trust and what the amygdala does is to learn vigilance and distrust. So mm -hmm. it's basically, I know a lot of people talk about fight or flight mode yeah. when we're stressed mm -hmm. out. So it's that part of our brain that sort of knows how to react to protect. And mm -hmm. so to be distrustful because we want to be protective and to be mm -hmm. vigilant for that reason. I think the most important part is he says that, she, okay, so your eyes, also sees the threat, right? If you're faced yeah. with a lion and then it goes to your visual elements and it is still, pro your visual cortex is still processing, but your amygdala, there is a shortcut to amygdala, which is already telling you to flee, yes. right? But it is always error prone because that's why your brain has devised this de detailed system of processing via different sensory elements like cortices like visual cortex etc but still amygdala sometimes helps and you know saves your life how many times you don't know so that was a fine uh insight how the brain works you know you sometimes wait like should i flee or not and by the time if your cortex has done its analysis and says it's okay it's safe it was a false alarm Stay where you are. You said that so well. So it's basically the idea is that you process information through your visual cortex. It goes to your amygdala. That was kind of what I gathered. And you react so quickly that mm -hmm. you're, but you're not necessarily having the most accurate assessment of what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually react from a state of fear or aggression or mm -hmm. both. He does make the distinction. I think like towards the end of the chapter, I found, he says, Fear typically increases aggression only in those already prone to it, which I thought was interesting. Right, right, right. I think it, he ex, uh, he expands that a lot in the testosterone uh, topic when it, when it comes mm -hmm. to the yeah. hormones. And that was really uh, eye-opening for me. I actually read it out to my husband saying that, hey, testosterone does not cause aggression. It just <laughs> amplifies it 
to who are already prone to aggression so that was kind of a great insight well, um yeah i think that that that's an important point throughout the book is that there's always mm-hmm. variation when it comes mm-hmm. to what we can find neurologic you know with these things so for mm-hmm. like there might be certain trends and patterns but mm-hmm. like even when you talk about the fight or flight response those are two very different responses to mm-hmm. stress to a stressful stimuli so yeah. you can either freeze or you can like run away but Not those away. are two totally different <laughs> or you could freeze and, and, or you can fight, you know, those two things or, or flee or fight. So those are two different kinds of responses. They're not necessarily, it's not necessarily predictive in that, in that manner. Mm-hmm. And then he talks about insular cortex. Basically it's, it, it was very fascinating for me. Again, something new that I discovered that it, it's about uh, a gustatory disgust. So when you eat something which is stale or spoiled yeah. already, then it, uh, you know, um, you get a disgusting feeling. But what was interesting is it is the same area of the brain that triggers moral disgust as well. So that's yes. why when you see something morally disgusting, you feel like retching or puking or, you know, you get sick to your, sick to your yeah. stomach. Yeah. That was actually one of the most interesting parts, which he gets into yeah. in a later chapter as well. Yeah. And I think he, he had an exact term for it that I can't recall off the top of my head, but it's basically mm-hmm. when I guess our brains sort of evolved to recycle a certain part of, for this, for a different function. So the same mm-hmm. part of the brain, the insula, which mm-hmm. sort of knows. Yeah, yeah I remember that, but I got, yeah. Mm-hmm. To get the reacts when we have, like, when we smell something bad, even when we think of something that smells bad, or mm-hmm. if we think mm-hmm. of something that's gross or disgusting, our insula gets activated, but that mm-hmm. same exact part of the brain has been recycled to yeah. you to be utilized, like to, um, to assess when something's morally wrong or mm-hmm. to have like, I guess, a strong discomfort about moral decision-making. And he makes a point at some point in the book and he says, this is going to be talked about in a later chapter about people who are around smelly trash, that they end up being much less open-minded to social mm-hmm. issues. And he mm-hmm. says, for example, gay marriage, then mm-hmm. they are to other types of sort of political issues. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I don't remember the example he gave. I but, think but he, he talks was, about social conservative. So if you're in a room, uh, making decisions, but you're surrounded by garbage, you are prone to be more conservative in your decision making or your choices or your opinions. That's what he said. I Which think. is so wild. <laughs> so I guess that idea is that your insula is activated. And so mm. you're going to be more, um, un- I guess, more dis- I don't know. I, I guess I don't you got under- that. You're going to be more, yeah. I had a hard time understanding why that would be different, social issues specifically, than other kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. He said that you wouldn't really change as much about um, other kinds of like political issues, but more social ones. And so Mm -hmm. it was interesting. I could probably try to find that, but I thought that was really interesting. And then he comes to the main important part of the brain. I think the recently developed frontal cortex and uh, he summarizes it well in one sentence, which says that it, it does the harder thing to do when it is the right thing to do. So yes. that's where, you know, all your thinking and your reasoning and your logic comes in and then amygdala takes a backseat, right? And then you, you're making decision based on, I don't know, uh, all kind of logical explanation that you can find. Well, that's what I found so fat. I found that so fascinating because I was just recent, recently reading a book that kind of delved into the theme of, of, um, not free will of willpower. And he talks Mm. about how willpower is actually a real thing. It's more than just a metaphor. And he talked about cognitive load because it actually takes, it takes calories. It takes energy Mm. expenditure to utilize the free prefrontal cortex when you're trying to learn a task. Mm -hmm. So you only have so much of that. And that's something that's important to know, especially when we're in academia and there could be a high expectation on studying as much as possible and learning as much as possible. There really is only so much capacity that we all have to Mm -hmm. have for willpower as far as willpower is concerned. And Mm -hmm. it's interesting too, because like, and it also 
Um, God, there's a lot to say about this, but basically when you're concentrating on a task, when you're learning something, it's interesting. You can even actually see it in people's faces. Sometimes when they're concentrating, they might throw their brows (laughs) and they might think, but you're actually really utilizing the prefrontal cortex when you're engaging in learning something. And then over time, as it becomes habitual, then the activity goes to the other parts of the brain and not Mm -hmm. so much of this energy is needed. So like Mm -hmm. when somebody's learning to play like a piano scale, for example, for the first time, Mm -hmm. they might have to think about where their fingers go over time. They don't have to think Mm -hmm. about it anymore. The muscle memory is, is is a habit. It's automated. Yeah. It's automated. But then he also Mm kind of talks about what you're, brings it into what you're talking about that sometimes Mm -hmm. we'll get stuck in these patterns of the whole, you know, the whole saying that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. When you get stressed out, you might keep trying to do the same thing over and over again, and it's not working. But if you take, you know, if you basically utilize the prefrontal cortex, then you can sort of strategically do the harder thing. And that comes into moral decision making, it comes into sort of habitual patterns of stress. And that's what helps us to, to make strategic decisions, I think. Dopamine system. And, you know, this uh, pleasure and reward system that he talks a lot about uh, that as well in this chapter. And uh, it's, that was what, fascinating. <laughs> right. What I took away from this one, oh, of course, there's a lot, of, lot to take away. But one thing that I noticed is that it's not just uh, the pleasure of the reward, but it's also the anticipation of getting the reward. So even before you get the reward, your dopamine system is activated once you know what's going to happen, uh, when a certain action more so, is it's, it activates more. You get yeah. more dopamine with the expectation yeah. of a reward that's likely mm-hmm. to happen, and then you get a little dopamine bump mm-hmm. at when you actually have the reward. Yeah. And that just blew my mind, honestly. Right? I did not know that. That was something I did not know, mm-hmm. and. I, I have actually watched a video since then that talked about that a little bit on a different, mm-hmm. of a different, um, I guess, platform, but mm-hmm. that just, it, it's interesting just to know that because a lot of times we are focused on the reward and not knowing that the build up to that is actually <laughs> where a lot of that takes place. A lot of the dopamine anyway. Yeah. People say, right. It's not the, uh, I mean, it's the journey, but not the destination, something like that. Like, you know, even that anticipation gives you some kind of reward. And also there's another thing that he mentioned that when the chances of the reward is reduced by 50%, then again, the, uh, the dopamine is activated much more than when there is 100%. That was also fascinating to find out. Well, to me, it makes sense, though. It makes sense because mm-hmm. I... If you think about like when you're reading a really good fiction book, especially fantasy, we always mm-hmm. like most of us tend, the trend is to love, I should say the general trend is to love a book that has high stakes, meaning mm. that it can go either way. If we know it's going to come to a satisfying end a hundred percent of the time and exactly the way we anticipate, then we're probably not going to be that invested. It's yeah. not going to be as rewarding. Yeah, we're not yeah, going to be as invested. It's right. the same thing has been shown in music psychology too. If you have the same music pattern over and over again, there could be kind of, um, there could be some reward to that, to having a, an established pattern. But if mm-hmm. it never changes, then mm-hmm. you're going to get lose engagement over time. But if you mm-hmm. change it just a little bit, then that little yeah. bit of unpredictability gets you more engaged right. all of a sudden. And then you, you know, you have to have a balance between anticipation and Mm -hmm. predictability so that sort of that relationship made a lot of sense to me personally wow okay that's cool and then he talks about a couple of other brain regions like fusiform cortex which is for face recognition and then uh, yes right uh Mm -hmm. oh that comes up a lot later on and uh, (laughs) kind of very sobering findings related to face uh, recognition I did know about some of that, honestly. Um, I actually had read a book before called, I cannot remember the exact title. It was by Dan Siegel. I think it was The Developing Mind is what it was called. And so I did know about, I think the theory of mind is what he's talking Mm -hmm. about, Mm -hmm. which is Mm -hmm. a process in your, that happens in early development where we're able to tell different faces from one another. We're able to kind of see 
there, and we were able to understand not not even just face recognition. It's also the understanding that different people have different beliefs and yeah. their own. And that's actually a phase in development. And they have found that certain parts that are related to that ability are found to be slightly impaired, I think, in mm-hmm. autism spectrum disorder. And he talks mm-hmm. about that a little bit here too. Yeah. So it was an interesting finding there. Wow. Yes. And then uh, anterior cingulate, which is all about empathy and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, like for example, you, when you see somebody, getting an injection you also slightly cringe because you might you you also feel like you're feeling it <laughs> so yes so i loved by the way <laughs> dude where's my prefrontal cortex hey dude where's my prefrontal cortex <laughs> which was a whole chapter about teen being a teenager and why why this isn't fully developed i guess in teenage years mm. and how teenagers actually have quite a bit of empathy uh, right. but they have empathy they much more relate to, I think he said first person rather than third person mm-hmm. type of mm-hmm. relating. So it's more like, how would you feel in that situation? And they can feel what that feels like rather than how do they feel? It's not as easy for them to kind of think that way. They have to sort of put themselves in that first mm-hmm. person and they, but they feel things at a very heightened level but feeling things at a very heightened level, feeling what other people feel at a very heightened level um, is not necessarily going to lead to the best decision-making. You're right. <laughs> so that was also very interesting. And he talked, I think, at length about how mm-hmm. empathy, learning mm-hmm. to be altruistic or respond from a place of empathy does mm-hmm. require a little bit of distancing, oddly. Right. Right, because uh, the actions does not come if you are completely because you try if you are completely bothered uh, by somebody's uh, misery, then you try to detach yourself and turn your face away instead of acting or trying to help that person. Oh, right? that's a good point. So he does say there are two ways that detachment can go. So one mm-hmm. is that what you said to detach mm-hmm. and turn away, but mm-hmm. actually having um, but having a little bit of distance at the same time, like if you're feeling mm-hmm. it and then having a little bit of distance can help you respond too. Mm-hmm. So it can go right. two ways. I actually did put two attachment can go two ways. So it's a, uh, it, let me see if I could read the exact paragraph. He says the adolescent empathy frenzy can seem a bit much for adults, but what it, when I see my best students in that state, I have the same thought. It used to be mm-hmm. much easier to be like that. My adult frontal cortex may enable me, it may, may enable whatever detached good I do. The trouble, of course, is how the same detachment makes it easy to decide that something is not my problem. <laughs> so that's right. the interesting, that was an interesting finding when it comes to empathy is just an altruism in general. Mm-hmm. There were a right. few points about that also about how the more people are around, the mm-hmm. more it could be like, oh, somebody else will take care of that. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, nobody helps yeah uh, and then uh, in the next chapter i think he talks about um seconds to minutes where um i'm just jumping into the next chapter because i think we have cover- covered everything in the brain region do you agree sure. yeah, yeah. So this- i'm sorry i jumped like 10 chapters like five chapters ahead or something <laughs> that's okay <laughs> like i said you know all, all, you, as long as the conversation is organic it's much more interesting uh so for sensory input or environmental uh, influence on our behaviors, we already cover the garbage part where we, it makes us more socially conservative, you know, and then there is this one interesting thing about judge and parole hearing. If there are judges who are uh, doing parole hearing, it's more likely that they give um, or sanction more paroles if it's right after lunch. And then it goes down towards the end of the day because your, like you said, prefrontal cortex, it takes a lot of glucose, like energy, it needs to function. And if your blood glucose level is high, then your decision-making ability is much better and then you can empathize better and then you make the right decision or you, know, you are prone to give more positive responses. But when the glucose level goes down, the situation reverses. And uh, 
this is where i think science should play a role in kind of revising criminal justice system which we will talk i think in the later oh yeah and he's yeah. actually he's gone to bat for that is what he mm-hmm. said i think in the book that that's actually mm-hmm. something he's highly pushed for right mm-hmm. that judges uh, don't that- judge on an empty stomach <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Because this is the second time that I heard I think I I read the same thing in the, the uh, there is another book called Kindness to Strangers uh oh. the same experiment was repeated there as well. Kindness of strangers sorry. Okay, racial profiling uh also but like it, it takes one by 10th of a second to do racial prof- racial profiling and the you because amygdala is kicking in and fear when you see somebody who is different from you and it the amygdala kicks in and fear kicks in because you don't know this person or you don't know this kind of person <laughs> so fear kicks in and then yeah you do a racial profiling right there yes and it's interesting i also um i also highlighted a quote that he said i wrote it down here he, so he said um and i'm paraphrasing it a little bit he said mm-hmm. as a result are we hardwired to fear the face of someone of another race to process their face as uh as their face less as a face to feel less empathy and he said mm-hmm. not really because one there is a tremendous amount of individual variation not everyone's amygdala activates in response to another race face and those exceptions are informative so mm-hmm. it's important to know that this isn't universal that this isn't mm-hmm. necessarily always the case and two mm-hmm. he says subtle manipulations rapidly change the amygdaloid response to the face of the other so i thought it was mm-hmm. interesting that i was i thought that was hopeful that mm-hmm. it's not that we're hardwired to do that but mm-hmm. at the same time that can be the case and that's an amygdala response and rather than remove the amygdala we need the amygdala uh, we need to learn how to work through that and i think something you talked about perhaps it was in that chapter were about appraisals was that in that mm-hmm. chapter cognitive I, appraisal i think so i'm not sure which chapter exactly or is it reappraisals i don't know if i'm saying the word right and that's right. basically when we're in a stressful situation uh mm-hmm. rather than just trying to buck down and not you know uh and try to work through like try to force our way through it i think mm-hmm. i cannot remember the terminology used for that we can use these reprisals which means to sort of rethink the way we understand what's happening so mm-hmm. for example if that happens we can actually actively think that's not real that's mm-hmm. my amygdala having a response that mm-hmm. is not based on reality so that would be like a cognitive reprisal i don't know if that's the best example of one but uh it's more like if you're seeing a a movie i think is the example he gave if you're seeing like a horror scene in a movie and you're getting triggered by that people can actually work through that by thinking that's not real that's a movie that's makeup those are yeah. actors and they're able to kind of work through those situations mm-hmm. i thought that was absolutely cool now we move on to the next chapter which is ours today and it talks about hormonal effects on our behavior and i think the most important uh hormone that comes into your into our, into our mind when things that shape our behavior i think it's uh, testosterone and that where he also starts with and he talks about this relationship or this common um uh what do you call the belief that uh, testosterone creates aggression in human males or males in, in generally so primates basically so he says that and he explains that very beautifully and scientifically which i am not capable to do but the conclusion was that it's not that testosterone creates aggression but it gen- it just accentuates or in- um what do you call it? yeah accentuates violence or aggression in people who are already prone to it and that was eye opening for me and it just another factor that he said is that also it's not just about aggression it's about the kind of behavior a male will express when his status is challenged so it could be that a status is challenged and he is in the uh, he is surrounded by females and the best course of action for him to 
uh, be is to be a gentleman at that point in time to maintain his status quo or status so at that time he will not opt for aggression the testosterone will steer him to do more gentlemanly things <laughs> so that, that was also so very eye opening yeah. right <laughs> yeah yeah i feel like um talk about hormones is probably i like the way he explained it because i mm. i was made to understand it the same way that a lot of times we think of hormones as like oh this person has an elevated amount of testosterone or um a or estrogen and that's going to cause this or that but actually hormones are way more nuanced than that even mm -hmm. in general um mm -hmm. rather and he also of course like you said he makes a very strong point that they don't cause behavior they mm -hmm. more are about kind of enhancing behaviors that were already mm -hmm. kind of existing for whatever reason right. and mm -hmm. the but the idea that i've understood about hormones is that there are ho hormones and then there are, I guess, hormone receptors. So like hormones right. are the keys, and then there are the receptors and in different individuals, you could have like less of a hormone, but maybe you have more of that hormone receptor that just matches mm. up. And so you'll have a greater effect in that one individual than the other person who might have the same amount of hormone or more. So actually mm. when you get a panel to see how much weight your hormones are, it's not always mm. the most accurate, especially if you just have one sample of it. It's usually useful to see things over time, see patterns, mm -hmm. and then mark it as individual, you know, as an individual rather than comparing it to the collective, because we're all kind of different in that sense. So I thought it was nice that he kind of explained the nuances with that in particular, and why it's so tricky and why we can't make these sort of evaluative judgments about people's mm -hmm. hormone levels. Right. And uh, I, I love the sentence uh, a lot. Um, it's on page number 107 on my copy, in my copy. In our world riddled with male violence, the problem isn't that testosterone can increase levels of aggression. The problem is the frequency with which we reward aggression. So, mm -hmm. like, yeah. basically, so if you keep on rewarding uh, males for demonstrating aggression, then the hormone will steer him towards that because if that is what is needed to maintain his status in the society or yeah. in the hierarchy. <laughs> yeah, that's it's basically kind of like a nurture versus nature mm. sort of uh, concept. So a lot right. of times, like uh, there's always been an argument in uh, sociology, I guess it would be whether we are naturally hardwired, mm. genetically hardwired to do certain things or hormonally hardwired in certain ways, or is it the environment that's affecting mm. us? Is mm. it the nurture or is it the nature? Right. And I feel like he's basically saying you can't really separate the two and uh, they both are important. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, in that case, like what you said, that that's an important factor. I think he kind of says in the same exact chapter about alcohol and how mm -hmm. alcohol doesn't make people right. more aggressive. It mm -hmm. just enhances aggression in people who are already prone to already aggressive, aggressive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you might have the totally opposite effect on somebody else right. so you can't excuse somebody for you know yeah, i was drunk <laughs> that's yeah, not an excuse, that. that's not an excuse. <laughs> yeah moving on to another uh interesting hormone which is oxytocin we all about mother child bonding and uh, pair bonding and trust and generosity but the fascinating fact for me was when you talk about it generates trust and generosity it comes with a caveat that it's not it's it, it generates trust and generosity but people who are like us and it could create hostility towards people who are not like us that's so. right yeah <laughs> In your close circle, it'll create right. more bonding, but it also creates some more exclusivity and othering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was absolutely fascinating. I, mm -hmm. I definitely think there's truth to that. Mm -hmm. Right. And also, I really want to talk about this point about uh, PMS that he makes, PMS and female aggression. And I was so happy that the science clearly established that there is no clear indication that during PMS um, that women are not particularly aggressive, right? Yeah. It, it, it's not that. And that was fascinating because it is just so common that anytime a woman, it's, you know, it's, it's there in all kinds of jokes, you know, it's everywhere. 
repeated and told and then it, it's accepted as truth but science clearly says that there is no clear evidence that pms and aggression are related in any way so there is this chapter from weeks to months it talks about uh, neurons uh, neuroplasticity and neurogenesis in adults i i guess all i will say about that is i guess he explains how there was an idea that mm-hmm. you stop being able to learn new skills at a certain mm-hmm. age that you mm-hmm. no longer have neuroplasticity that it basically stops at a certain age and what we know now is that you can but it's the heart it's that the longer that you wait the harder that becomes mm-hmm. but you still can and that's yeah. something that's important to know so mm-hmm. basically they you know the old the saying that an old dog can't learn new tricks i think that's the saying uh, right. right well we can we can as we age but it does take more effort than it does when we're younger by the way my husband has a wonderful analogy of neuroplasticity that i love He said Mm -hmm. that if you think about it like a forest and let's say like neural pathways can be like trails down a forest. So Mm -hmm. you might be used to those neural pathways and you go down Mm -hmm. those neural pathways because that's what you're used to. Your brain is programmed those neural pathways to make those associations, to make those connections, to go down that familiar road, to know what to do here. And so creating a new skill or learning something new is basically like bushwhacking a new trail. So at first that is really hard to do and it could be really tempting to go down the familiar established trail. So neuroplasticity Mm -hmm. is like creating that new trail, but it's absolutely possible. It just Mm -hmm. takes a lot more effort, a lot more Mm -hmm. concentrative effort skill, probably cognitive load, Mm -hmm. (laughs) probably back to prefrontal cortex activity, I'm assuming and glucose, like you mentioned. So, uh, but it is absolutely possible. Right. That's a great analogy. I'll keep that in mind if I have to explain it to somebody. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So adolescence, we did definitely cover a little bit of uh, adolescence and empathy. You you covered a little bit. The frontal cortex actually develops completely only when you are around 25 years old it's still developing it's still it's still being built and uh, that's an interesting fact because frontal cortex is all about reacting to environment and or you know and about reacting to your uh, cultural uh, environment as well so it's all about learning and then your brain builds the frontal cortex so there is a reason why it is not fully developed until you are 25 years old and that's why also this juvenile justice system i don't know if they have taken the science but the science now confirms with the juvenile justice system that you know you um you don't punish a juvenile the same way as you punish an adult and this is a solid reason not to do so because their impulse controls are not with them or not well developed as compared to an adult well it's interesting too i think the other point he makes in that chapter too is that desire for i'm trying to think of the word he used for this for novelty that we are oh, the teenagers yes. also have a desire for novelty and so they might take make make bigger risks but they're mm-hmm. also not the best at accurately mm-hmm. processing information because that prefrontal cortex isn't finished developing but <laughs> they want the novelty right. so they're willing to kind of risk things just to be different or just to get attention or just to be special and also prenatal environment that was also very fascinating because uh he talks about uh, what happens the kind of hormones you're exposed to while you're in your mother's womb will have an effect on your behavior 30 years from now that's crazy <laughs> that isn't it that's crazy and scary also right and yeah. um, but also uh, for me there was an important point about um a sex uh, sex typical behavior uh when it comes to hormones so if you are exposed more to testosterone then even if you are born as a female uh, if you're exposed yeah. while you're in your mother's womb then that will determine the way you behave uh in the future and also your if you're born a female then your chances of becoming gay or a lesbian is higher so this is why gender studies are so important i feel because there is so much for us to understand about this and not to dismiss this as some kind of whim of people you know just trying to dress up or something all these controversy around the lgbtq plus so all these gender issues i think 
the brain needs to be studied basically a lot. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That was absolutely fascinating. Right? And also uh, in that chapter, I thought what was also fascinating was the marshmallow test is in that chapter. Yes, <laughs> I have that. I love were you that. Familiar with that. With Were you familiar with that before the book? No, the no. Yeah, you can actually find videos on YouTube about the mm -hmm. marshmallow test. And um, so that is actually a very depressing sort of study. <laughs> mm -hmm. But basically what happens is that they put marshmallows in front of these children and they would give them a test saying, when I come back, if you haven't eaten the marshmallow in 15 minutes, you will be rewarded with the second marshmallow. And they videotape these children and you see them doing things from like sitting on their hands to trying to cover their eyes, to petting the marshmallow or right. trying to take a little bit of the marshmallow off. And the, so the crazy thing is that some of the kids were able to do it. They were able to pass the marshmallow test and some weren't. But what was more striking was when they followed these kids much, much later in life. And they found that those who passed the marshmallow test just overall made better decisions, made better mm -hmm. life decisions, had more stable lives. And those who didn't pass the marshmallow test, it was quite the opposite. Right. And so I think that was incredibly humbling. Right. Because how right. early does that start? Absolutely. The same chapter he talk, goes and talks about childhood adversity can, you know, cause stress and then it can, uh, you know, blunt the functioning of hippocampus and frontal cortex. But it's the opposite in amygdala. Lots of adversity and amygdala becomes larger and hyperactive. So one of the one consequence is increased risk of anxiety disorders when coupled with poor uh, frontocortical development. It explains problems with emotion and behavior regulation. So if you are exposed to abuse as a child or any kind of adversity, poverty also later on when so social uh, situations come into play, your amygdala is hyperactive and then you are prone to all kinds of disorders like depression, anxiety disorders, ADHD and things like that. Absolutely. And I don't, I don't think that anybody who goes through these adverse situations is necessarily doomed, but mm. at the same time, it's the probability is going to be much, much higher or greater for challenge later in life. So he talks about two types of adversity that one can uh, face as a child and they should be considered separately. Observing violence, there is this one paragraph about exposing children to a violent TV or film clip increases their odds of aggression soon after. Interestingly, the effect is, uh, effect is stronger in girls. So that, again, it you know, surprised me. Effects are stronger when kids are younger or when the violence is more realistic and or is presented as heroic. Such exposure can make kids more accepting of aggression in one study. Watching violent music videos increased adolescent girls' acceptance of dating violence. Fortunately, he does say that there are two caveats, though, at the bottom mm -hmm. of page 198. He says... There yeah. is no evidence that catastrophically violent individuals, mass shooters, mm -hmm. are that way because of childhood exposure to violent media. And B, exposure does not remotely guarantee increased aggression. Yeah. Instead, effects are strongest on kids already prone towards oh, violence. violence. <laughs> For them, yeah. exposure desensitizes and normalizes their own aggression. Right. So it's it's more that it it really doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> rather than exactly. it causes, I think is what, what I gather from that. I think that sort of what he kind of gets at, at the end of the book is mm -hmm. just, is just the importance of how, well, I think one thing that we can say actually was priming, how, how we are very susceptible to priming or mm -hmm. to certain things that we're not even aware of. So for example, he talks about perception of other people based on whether we were sitting on a soft chair or a hard chair or right. whether, you know, that we might have a harder perception of somebody if we're sitting on a hard chair versus mm -hmm. if we're sitting on a soft chair, we might have a softer perception of somebody or mm -hmm. the way that we might think people are colder when we're holding a cold drink right, versus right. when we're holding a hot drink. And I thought that mm -hmm. was so funny mm -hmm. for me personally, because I grew up spending a lot of times in coffee shops and I later on looked back and thought, I think holding a cup, a cup of coffee 
was more like there was a warm, the warmth kind of made me feel less anxious, (laughs) but I think it probably did. I don't know. I think there are certain little things like that can, that can affect our perception way Mm -hmm. faster and more in in a more unconscious way than we realize we're way more susceptible to that. He has Mm -hmm. a whole entire chapter on symbols and how symbols affect the way that we perceive societies, the way that we create tribalism, how tribalism takes place, uh, the way that we just, you know, see people as other. I think that's a big aspect of the book. Right. So there is this entire chapter about us and them, right? Us versus them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think we have again, spoken about that a little bit, right, you know, because the brain pros, brain groups people uh, with unconsciously already into in-groups and out-groups, and these in-groups and out-groups are, are on a different hierarchies, many hierarchies also. Many, yes, like, that's right? a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. Right? So you and me could be one in-group, like a female in-group. Yeah. But then I could create a separate in-group and you could be out-group when it comes to countries, if I consider. So how, how does brain processes all these many variant groups, right? It's yes. fascinating. But um, what, what depresses me is that sometimes these kind of in-grouping and out-grouping creates conflicts. And then it needs our frontal cortex to come with the right logic, you know, to overcome all that. And you must say that they are the same, you know, or you don't have to be violent towards them. And that comes from a social conditioning and the environment that we are, our education, how in, in terms of how educated we are about these topics, not about, you know, um, academic education, but, you know, how educated we are about our environment, how we treat each other as human beings. So like you said, the, 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 in, the main takeaway is that despite what the science is saying that, you know, we have these factors that influence our behavior, we can, we don't have to choose violence. We do have the option to choose empathy. <laughs> that yes. was a very nice uh, way to end or conclude. 100%. He talks a little bit about some of the studies that are found in Alter Traits, which is that book mm-hmm. that Brandon and I read. Right. Um, he even talks about Richard Davidson's study on the monks and how they found, I mean, I know that that was something I really took away from altered traits, but he kind of brings it up in here too, which is about, there's a difference between having empathy. A lot of times people equate empathy with a compassion, but they're mm. really kind of two separate processes. Because if you watch somebody who's on fire and you get uncomfortable watching that, you might just try to get away so that, like you mentioned that earlier, get away so you don't feel that discomfort. Mm-hmm. And you might be feeling empathy, but you, it just might make you want to go and detach more. Mm-hmm. And then there's a difference between that and wishing, having empathic concern for somebody. So wishing mm-hmm. compassion from, for somebody, there's a big difference. And there's a big difference on circuits in the brain that are wired when we, when we have empathic concern. So just having empathy, it doesn't really do much. It actually might mm-hmm. even work against altruism. Mm-hmm. It's actually mm-hmm. what, wanting to go towards it that is going to make a change. And right. there are so many factors. That is the hard thing to do. And when we say hard thing to do, I mean, it's hard for, again, the prefrontal cortex has to engage, but also it's hard because of so many other environmental sociological factors, including he talks a lot about tribalism. So the stakes right. of yeah. what that might mean for you not to be racist if you're with a group of racists, you know, <laughs> right. um, who carry that message and to, to make that harder decision or uh, to say somebody or to for- forgive somebody and maybe the guilt and shame other people would feel that you forgave somebody who did something wrong or bad. So that kind of, that kind of empathy, that type of altruism or that type of compassion can have, have high stakes depending on the environment, depending on the social structures that you're in, depending on a lot of other factors that make that hard for you. (laughs) Uh, But at the same time, he, uh, he gives some beautiful examples of people who have been able to do that historically and the ramification, the impact that that's had on us today, seeing that example is so powerful. 
So even yeah. though we might not see the rewards immediately, they do have an impact. Right. And he also says uh, that, you know, how do we overcome these kind of differences or dichotomy that is created in our brain, like us versus them and all that. And he says that we have to accept there will always be sides. There will, yes. You know, and distrust essentialism. So essentialism is assigning some kind of essence, mostly negative essence to outgroups. So you discard that, but you think of them as individuals. So discard essentialism and embrace individualism and you know think of them as individuals so that you develop this empathy and then focus on shared larger goals practice perspective taking and um, individuate 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 <laughs> he keeps yes. repeating that so yes. you know you have to i think to do good we have to put in a, a lot more effort than i i know by, you know, rather than, you know, it's easier to be bad, I think, <laughs> yeah. than to be good. <laughs> well, I mean, he's, he, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll just restate, he doesn't say that we're necessarily mm -hmm. hardwired to be, to be bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, he does try to make that really clear. It's more just how we're responding in our environments. Right. So maybe we might be in an environment that actually promotes more empathy or promotes more kindness or altruism. Um, but if we don't, then it's going to be even harder work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, 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 I think you're right, though, it can, I mean, it's easy to kind of look at some of this stuff and get feel a little, little doomed. <laughs> feel, <laughs> but I don't think it's necessarily like, he's not making the case that it's no, that I think he Right. I think his point is more positive outlook on all this, despite all this is happening inside our brain. We still have, you know, we should have positive outlook towards um, life and our species as a whole, I think. That's, that's the message I think I would take away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's how I took it. I know mm -hmm. there's a, a, oh, it looks like we're down on time again, but. <laughs> yeah, I think we are almost done. You, you want to make some concluding um, uh, summary? I think the concluding summary I'd make is just how how beautifully humbling this book is and how well he synthesizes all of these different lenses from again the neurological to the endo endocrinological I cannot say that word very well mm -hmm. and to the sociological even looking at aspects of history and evolution the sort of genetic and environmental interaction how all these factors can influence our behavior and maybe give us again less control than we think we have, but at the same time, uh, showing what is possible, especially as we learn to actively do the harder things sometimes, you know. And so, right. uh, I do think, like I said, I took some hope from this. And mm -hmm. as he, I think his last bullet, bullet point in the whole entire book was my favorite, which is that you don't have to be scientific to be compassionate. I think that's right. what he said. Is that right? So yes. yeah, I absolutely loved this book. I thought it was so powerful, so beautifully written. He does have some ending chapters on war and peace mm -hmm. on some of the most horrific acts of uh, human violence that you can imagine mm -hmm. of brutality that you can imagine mm -hmm. that are heartbreaking that drove me to tears at times. And at the right. same time, I was driven to tears by some of the most beautiful acts of compassion that he brought forth too. So. Well, yes, very well summarized, uh, Joanna. I would add, add only one more thing. People might think that, you know, it is hard science that is discussed and it, is, it might be dry and boring, but it's not. He is oh, yeah. really funny and humorous. There are yes. so many, uh, 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 he is really good in explaining things. It's not as dry and boring as we discussed here, <laughs> he definitely has a humorous side to him. So do not so, think that it's boring. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing we didn't really talk about was, um, of course, the free will chapter, but there is a whole free will chapter. Right. The right. whole humunculus. <laughs> yes. The <laughs> ever. So funny that we have this humunculus yeah. in the brain. Anyway, highly recommend this. I cannot yeah. wait until his next book in which he goes more deeply into the topic of free will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for now, this was just, this was so well-written. This is a universal recommend for me. Right. Absolutely. And uh, 
don't be intimidated by its size take your time all of you guys if you're interested in human behavior and read this book and let us know what you think about yeah absolutely yes <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining guys bye bye thank you so much angie thanks jana